So this is a picture of a planet. And something really remarkable happened here a long time ago, about four billion years ago. Just as the planet had cooled enough to become a water world to support liquid water, a little spark of life emerged. And that spark of life took root, it grew, it made more copies of itself as life does, and every copy had some variation, some mistakes in it. And so it diversified as it spread across the globe, ultimately covering this planet. And this is our planet. There is no nook or cranny left untouched by life. It's a marvelous, living, wild, diverse, beautiful place. Everywhere we look, we see incredible living creatures swimming and flying, competing, cooperating, all of them reproducing, making more of themselves, and everything singing a song that we kind of recognize in the bottom of our hearts. There are brothers and sisters, all these incredible freakish creatures. They make our air, they clean our water, they grow our food. They sing a song that we all get. We don't know whether life in the universe is common or rare. We don't even know if there's life elsewhere in the solar system. But we do know one thing for sure. We will never experience anything as wild and alive and remarkable and true as this little planet. It's our home. Increasingly, it's also our garden. We humans now dominate this globe. And to a large degree, every living creature on it, we are a part of the destiny creature on this planet. Unfortunately, it's been a little bit of a rough transition, changing roles from being just another species trying to eke out a living to being a species that has the ability to transform and reshape the entire planet. At times, we've made some mistakes. As you know, there have been times when, by accident, we've accidentally killed the last individual of a species. This is extinction. So extinction is a big deal. We all know it. We all feel it somewhere beyond the facts. We share a common ancestor with all of these creatures. When we lose them, we lose something special. We all understand this. It's an important thing. And because we are all related, because we are all brothers and sisters and cousins sharing a tiny little biosphere surrounded by endless, trackless, lifeless space, every time something goes extinct, we, we feel a sense of loss. We see, feel a sort of a sadness. And every time something goes extinct, we have to ask ourselves, when is it our turn? When do we go extinct? So tonight, I'm going to talk about extinction. Yeah, I'm going to talk about the terrible truth of the extinction crisis that we are causing. But I'm also going to talk about why I believe there's hope for a better tomorrow. I don't believe that we need to settle for a world that becomes more impoverished every day. As a scientist who values facts and data, I can tell you that extinction is not inevitable. As a, as a spirit who dreams, I can see a world in which we've stopped driving other species extinct, and maybe we even slow extinction a little bit further. As a human being who's searching for meaning for myself, as well as for my species, I think there's something really powerful to this idea. I think that in talking about it, we realize a real paradigm shift. And I think that if we take it on, we find meaning that could be the salvation of our species. First, I want to say that, yes, it's clear there is an extinction crisis underway. Humans have accelerated the rate of extinction. We've, caused, we've, we've driven countless species extinct. If we continue on the course, if we were to continue, terrible numbers would go extinct in the future. And extinction is natural. Every species goes extinct. There's kind of a lifetime to species. Humans have accelerated that life. They, humans have accelerated that extinction rate. If we were to do the same thing to a human lifespan, we would not live the 70 years or so that the Bible says we're supposed to live. Instead, our lifespans would be more like 25 days. And that's something that none of us have a right to do. So however, however dire all of this is, there is reason for hope. You'll hear people, you've probably all heard it before, people say, you know, it's hopeless, we can't save endangered species, endangered species laws don't work, it costs too much money, we just have to give up, it's natural anyway, let's just do something else. Um, that's kind of just a natural human reaction to bad news. But in this case, it's not necessary because the news isn't actually bad, it's actually really good. The facts show that we've actually had a lot of success at preventing extinction, at saving species from extinction. For example, the bald eagle shown here, 
was taken off the endangered species list in 2007. One of just many success stories that we've got and we should talk about more. Even more interesting than that is the fact that these were done with minimal investment. The United States Fish and Wildlife Service Recovery Branch is responsible for 1,500 rare, threatened, and endangered species. That's a lot. They have a budget of about $80 million a year. That's what Americans spend on bottled water every two days. Given the successes that we've had on that shoestring budget, you have to ask, what could we do if we really tried? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. I'm going to talk about a really great case example of what happens when you try to slow down or stop or even reverse extinction. I'm going to talk about California plants. And it's a great system for that. California is a global biodiversity hotspot. It's also home to 39, maybe by now 40 million humans and a totally uncountable number of bulldozers. So if you can save plants from extinction in California, you can, it, it suggests that you may be able to do more elsewhere. In 50 years of trying, we've tested some approaches, we've collected some data, we've learned some lessons. And so that's what I'm going to talk about now for a little while. So as I mentioned, California is a global biodiversity hotspot. We're one of 34 global biodiversity hotspots. This is a map of rarity and richness in the United States. As you can see, we're not the only place with some hotspots, but California has it going on. It's, off, it's literally off the charts. You can see, you know, we've got not just one hotspot, but multiple ones. We've got a quarter of the plants that are found north of Mexico are located in California. Here you've got, a, you've got a chart that shows the number of plants in each of the 50 states. Each of these bars corresponds to one of the 50 states, plus DC. On the far right, you have poor North, North Dakota. And on the far left, you've got crazy California, with 6,500 plant species that have been described. We're actually describing more every day. Um, far more than any other state. Moreover, a third of our plants are rare. You can see that other red bar. That's California rare plants. We actually have more rare plants in California than most states have plants. It's crazy. So it's not just a really big flora, but it's also a really interesting flora. We have all kinds of neat things mixed together. We have ancient lineages, living fossils, like these sequoia trees, the redwood trees, which once dominated the earth. They were once all over the place. They had their day in, on the stage. And then they step back. They've gone extinct from most of the planet everywhere except for California, where they persist. And we also have new lineages, like plants in the genus Dudleya, which have kind of radiated in California. As mountains get lifted up and interesting things happen, there's new opportunities for evolutionary radiations, new experimentation, new plants appear, which may not yet be big worldwide, but they're big in California and that we're testing them out. And when you, mix these things, when you mix these things together, the ancient lineages and the new evolutionary experiments, you have something really special, dynamic natural communities, where these things are interacting with each other, creating new types of habitats, new niches, and stimulating further diversity and radiation. So this is what we've got in California. It's fantastic. But of course, there's trouble in paradise. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we humans are doing to drive species extinct. The number two cause of, the number two threat to biodiversity in California, worldwide, you name it, is biological invasions. As we move around the world, we move around weeds, we move around insect pests, we move around diseases. This is a photo that I took at a preserve I managed about 15 years ago. Um, a preserve that had a really fantastic grove of glorious, huge, giant, ancient grandmother oaks. And this photo was the first tree to succumb to sudden oak death a disease that we introduced to California accidentally, which has wrought untold damage, including taking out that grove of mother oaks, grandmother oaks. And so biological invasions are a big threat, but they're not the number one threat. The number one threat is habitat loss. That's the number one cause of extinctions. This is a photo that I found in a junk shop in San Francisco entitled Poppies on Mount Tam. It was painted in 1937, before the Golden Gate Bridge was painted. And this is what Mount Tam looked like just two generations ago, a mountain, in Marin, north of the San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge, where someone would have to take a ferry across to, take, paint, to paint this scene. And this is what it looks like today. When we, when we take land for our uses, we kill the creatures that are on it, and we displace them. Global, global bulldozing is the number one threat to biodiversity in California on planet Earth. So that's what we're dealing with. Someone needs to do something about this, right? So let me tell you a little bit about what we've been doing in California, some of the stuff that we've tried. 
First, it's a lot easier to save things from extinction if you know what you got and you know where they occur. And so we have trained generations of scientists who have gone out, they've sought out these interesting and rare plants, they've mapped the rare plants, and they've mapped the rare natural communities. And because it's such a huge flora, we need a lot of help. So the California Native Plant Society put together a program called the Rare Plant Treasure Hunts, where we train regular folks like you and me, folks who we can identify plants just because we're descended from, you know, from Neanderthals who could identify plants. Not botanists, but people who can learn a few plants and then go out and look for them and map them. This is one of our bring your daughter and son to work day rare plant treasure hunts. This team on this day found one of the two rare plants that they were seeking. Statewide, our teams in five years have found 2,500 rare plants, about a third of those new discoveries. And so just to give you a quick, just to walk you through very quickly about what we do with these data, this is a project map for the Ivanpah Industrial Solar Development in the California desert. And this is a map of the rare plants that they knew to be there when they started the development project. We said, you really need to do some more current mapping. And so they did. These colored dots show the populations of rare plants that were found when we went out and actually looked. And so intuitively, you can understand the power of data. If you know where these things are, you can avoid them. You can avoid driving them extinct. If you don't know where they are, you're as likely to bulldoze them to extinction without even knowing that they're ever there. We can scale this up and actually use big data and pull all the information we have into very smart computers that help us to identify important plant areas, IPAs, a lot of people like to call them. Those areas that hold a special portion of California's evolutionary story. And when you find those IPAs, you can save them. This is an important plant area. This is the Vine Hill Preserve. This was purchased by the California Native Plant Society to protect three plants which otherwise would have gone extinct. All the surrounding lands that they grew on had been turned into vineyards and other development. This was it. This was the ark. Very small piece of property. Um, not much of a preserve. But it did the job. It has saved those plants from extinction just for a few thousand dollars. Some folks pulled together the piggy banks and bought this land, and now we have it. When you do that, when you do that for a lot of little areas and when you do it for a lot of big areas, it all adds up to something really incredible. What you're looking at here is a map of the protected lands in California. It's half the state. Half the state has been set aside for nature. In one of the places with the highest real estate values you can find anywhere, the people have come together and said, half of this we will not build. This is for nature. This is for all of that kind of stuff. Who does that? I mean, that's crazy. We do that. We did that. We need to get some credit for it. It's a big success. And it's a big part of why we've had other big successes. You would think that with our huge flora, almost 7,000 plant species, a third of them are already rare, and we build up California the way we have, you would think that we would have so many extinctions to cry over. But we only have 21 out of 6,500 plant species. And that's pretty incredible. Moreover, most of those didn't go extinct during the period that we've been trying to save these things. Most of those kind of predated this, this stuff. So those are some great successes at slowing down extinction, almost stopping it. But it's not enough. We need to get it to zero and, and maybe even a little bit beyond. And so here's how we're doing that. First of all, we're collecting seeds. When you look at this, please keep in mind that each one of those seeds is a living plant, a whole plant, everything, dormant waiting for a better time, waiting for the conditions that will cause it to germinate and grow and thrive. In a little envelope, you can have thousands of plants. In a refrigerator, you can have millions of plants. In a small building, you can have the entire flora. And so we are going out and collecting seeds from every rare plant in California. The idea here is that this is not conservation. This doesn't save them. This is a hedge against disaster. This is what you do when your computer's being wonky. You back it up. We're backing up the flora. We will do more to save these things. But once we have those seeds stored under really good conditions, we know that they won't go extinct. So that's an important approach. We can also de-extinct plants. We can actually roll back the extinction list. This plant is the Franciscan Manzanita, named after San Francisco, the city that was named after St. Francis, the patron saint of plants and animals. It was extincted in the 1940s when bulldozers took out the last of the great gold rush cemeteries until I spotted it driving along on a median at the Golden Gate Bridge. Turns out the extinct plant is actually alive. We've de-extincted it. And we can do that for other plants. We can de-extinct them by going out and searching for survivors. We can de-extinct them by going to herbarium sheets, museum specimens, and finding still living seeds that are dormant, that have lain dormant for decades. 
waiting for the right conditions to grow and pulling them off, giving them the conditions that they need so they can come back. We can roll back that extinct list. Pretty remarkable. So these are some of the things that we've done. A couple little tools. There's a lot more tools. The, the most powerful tools have yet to be invented. They do have one thing in common, though, and that's community. We have done this because we have come together to do it. This has been done by the community. You don't save 50% of the land of California without community being involved. And moreover, doing this has grown community. It's built a new kind of community. People who come from all kinds of different backgrounds with all kinds of interests, but focused on one thing, on saving these creatures. And so that's pretty interesting. I think in California, we've answered the question of can you slow down or stop or even reverse extinction. We've answered some of the questions about how. But you'll still pe hear people ask questions about, well, should we? Why? Why is it important? It's going to cost a lot of money. Can't we do something else? And so I want to go through some of those, you know, why should we answers. The first answers always have to do with money. Um, California has so many weird and pretty plants that we actually draw people from all over the world to come see them. It's a part of our multi-billion dollar tourist economy. People got jobs because we got weird plants. So that's an easy one right there. Another really easy one is that this is where, where we get our food and our medicine. And yes, the cure for cancer is out there, as is the cure for everything else. These organisms, be they plants, animals, fungi, whatever, every single one is a book full of secrets of how to live on planet Earth. And that book has been written over a billion generations. When a drought hits, everyone dies except for those that have the secret to surviving a drought encoded in their DNA. When a disease outbreak hits, same thing. At the end of the thing, you've got a book with all these secrets of how to live on planet Earth. We are just learning how to read those books. We may never be able to write something like that. And we will be depending on these secrets for as long as we are trying to live on planet Earth. There's a pretty compelling pragmatic reason to saving these. The, the engineering feedstock for the future, the most valuable commodity on planet Earth, the genes of these wild creatures that know how to live on our planet. But there's other kind of more immediate needs as well. We're learning that we have a hard time disconnecting from nature and surviving. As you all know, we've got an epidemic that's going on because people are not spending enough time in nature. Children have nature deficit disorder. Grown-ups got back problems and stomach problems and bad attitude. We, this is where we came from. When we forget that and disconnect from it, it makes us unhealthy. And so there is a value to connecting with it. And there's good data showing that the more diverse and interesting and dynamic a system is, the more the health benefits. And then there's other kind of more intellectual things. When you look at this, you're seeing the underlying mathematics of the universe. That goes all the way down to the base code of this reality, whatever it is. Each of these is a window into whatever it is that turns nothing into everything. And we're still trying to figure that out. So beyond just the aesthetics of it and the spirituality of it, there's a fundamental scientific principle to saving all of these little clues to whatever this is we are inhabiting. However, I think all of those are just excuses. I think the real reasons to save these things are just purely emotional. It makes us happy. It makes us, it is the right thing to do, and when we do it, we feel good. They make us feel free. They give us a feeling of joy. This is why we come together to save these things. And I think there's a really important clue here. Increasingly, as we humans develop the ability to do anything, we find ourselves wondering, what should we do? What is our purpose? Why are we here? I think that our purpose, I think what, are we, what we are here for, what we were built to do, is to care. Caring is a trait that's evolved a number of times in, in, it's evolved a number of times in the history of life. You have ants that care for fungus they eat. You've got killer whales that care for their babies. The evolutionary mathematics are very simple. Your, your siblings, three of your siblings have more of your DNA than you do, as do five of your nieces, as does your tribe. When you sacrifice yourself to save them, you have saved more of yourself than you have lost. It's pretty simple math. But we've taken it to an extreme. We care for everything. We care for our children. We care for our brothers. We care for our brother's children. We care for our neighbors. We care for our dogs. We care for our neighbor's dogs. We care for tardigrades. We care for everything. You can't stop us from caring. And when you do, bad things happen. And so I think that's why we all need to be involved in this for a couple reasons. First of all, we're facing some big challenges. And we make a lot about them. 
They're all completely solvable. We know the answers are out there, but we're not going to find them unless we listen to all the voices, unless all new voices are included and everyone has a chance to be a part of this. Moreover, this has such incredible meaning and gives such a feeling of rightness that everyone should have the opportunity to be privileged to work on this endeavor. So before I end, I just want to talk a little bit about this painting. It was painted by Peter Bruegel in 1500. It should have been, it should have rotted away centuries ago, but it didn't because we cared for it. Paintings have a natural lifespan. We extended the lifespan of this one. As a result, we can look at it and we can see what humans were like 500 years ago before the invention of everything. We can get an insight into the human condition that the painter never dreamed we would even be exploring. We can look for answers for questions that the painter would have never dreamed we would be asking. It's a conservation-dependent painting. You'll hear people talk about conservation-dependent species as if it was a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's an opportunity to care. We can care for species, too. And I can tell you that 500 years from now, our descendants will thank us for it. They'll thank us for saving the feedstock for food and cures for this and that. They'll thank us for saving beautiful things that give them insight into the nature of the universe. They'll thank us for taking on an endeavor that united the human species in some good pursuit and potentially saved us from extinction. But I think the main thing they'll thank us for is stuff that we just can't even imagine tonight. And so that's why I'm asking you to dare to care, to dare to end extinction. Thank you.